research around practice because as coaches, there's no question about it, practice is a key component to what you do. In fact, even elite level coaches will tell you, the games, there's not much you can do by game day. Your, most of your work happens in practice for the games. That's where you do your preparation. Game day, it's up to the players. With the exception of some slight adjustments in systems between periods, bulk of your work is practice. And so we talked about this, this is arguably one of the most important things you do. I don't think it's the most important thing. Tonight I'm going to talk about what I think is the most important thing that you do as coaches, and that is build character. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I don't want to insult anybody and suggest that you're not already doing that. You can't coach without building character. The only question is, how much of it are you building, and what kind are you building? And that's the, well, that's the, the, the focus of the presentation tonight. How much are you building, and what kind are you building?
a minute want to take away from the importance of that. It was brilliant. We, re we reclaimed our honor in the game. We've been dominating ever since. And we continue to dominate the game of hockey because we're teaching our kids that it is the of the game. It's a vague, it's part of a basic business fundamental model. Performance leads to achievement, leads to success. If you focus on technical skill development in any domain, sports, literature, business, I don't care, you focus on performance, you're going to achieve. High performance leads to high achievement. Lots of achievements eventually lead to success. And that's the model you've been operating on now for about 300 years. Start the Industrial Revolution, that's been the model of success. We applied it in the game, proofs in the pudding. Canada still dominates the game of hockey. <coughs> Create a great product. Everyone will buy it, make lots of money. Simple model, simple model. Practice to improve, you might make the NHL, and now you're looking at big dollars, lots of fame, model of success. Work hard and sacrifice, you might start a Fortune 500 company. Boys, if you do that, you've got money, fame, and power. That's the trifecta of success in our society. Money, fame, power. Now, the summit also chatted a little bit about another problem we had 15 years ago. We were taking the game too serious. There was an element of the summit that said, we've got to bring fun back in. And they were right, you gotta bring fun back into the game. But their particular approach was participation. You gotta get the kids participating and having fun. Because if you can do that, participate, you're gonna have fun, and you're gonna feel good about yourself. You're gonna feel good about yourself. You're gonna have lots of self-esteem. And self-esteem has been around now for about 40 years. The self-esteem movement started in the 50s. Excelled in the 70s. By the 80s, every Tom, Dick, and Harry was writing a book about self-esteem. Programs about self-esteem. And basically, here's the, here's the gist of the self-esteem movement. Every psychosis, every disease, every mental illness is caused by low self-esteem. So make sure, make sure you do nothing to harm a child's self-esteem, you will do fine. So we did things like Remove red markers from the schools. This is a bad idea. Big red marker, big red X on your test paper. You're not going to feel good about that. That's going to hurt your self-esteem. Let's do away with scores. Scoring. That's a bad thing. Scoring means you're going to have winners and you're going to have losers. The losers are going to feel bad. And if you feel bad, you're going to have low self-esteem. you have low self-esteem, going to end up at McDonald's with an MK40. <laughs> there's, a, there's a district, a school district in Massachusetts where I went to school. They do, they're doing uh, fitness testing. Fitness testing. Because right now, there's a big hullabaloo about the physical fitness of our youth. So this middle school has a fitness test that they run. They run a base at the beginning of the year fitness throughout the year, and then at the end of the year, they redo the test. One of the things they do in the fitness test is jump rope. So they get these kids to jump rope with no rope. They just skip. You know why? Because somebody might trip on the rope and fall or hurt their self-esteem. I'm not kidding. I can't make this up. I couldn't make this up. <laughs> They're afraid the kids might trip on the rope, so they get them to skip the I don't have a problem with participation, having fun, and building self-esteem. I do have a problem, we're going to see in a minute, one of the skills we've got to get back to with our kids is introducing a little bit of risk and adversity. Now, there's a problem with that model, performance, achievement, success. There's a problem with it. It's been working well in our industrial age for 300 years, but we're not living in that age anymore. Kids are more sophisticated. They're smarter. They have more information. My kids are online banking, 
And they don't do it. They don't exchange money with a human being anymore. They do it with a machine. I can't do that. The model's not working. And I'll show you why. I'm going to paint you a picture here, illustrate with a picture why that model doesn't work anymore. I want you to look at this group A list of applicants. Just read through the list. Let the names, your, your knowledge of these names, resonate with you a little bit and give you a general impression. Just read through the names and think about who these people are and what they represent. For whatever sport they play, for whatever they accomplished. What's wrong with the model? That's what I want to talk about. I don't think we're putting enough emphasis and focus. I think we can do better. I think we can do more. And if the lessons we've learned from 99 can apply to character, I want you to think about just how much of an impact we could have, how we could change the game again. We changed it twice. We changed it to 72. Right? 72, we had left wingers on the left side of the ice, right wingers on the right side of the ice. Centermen were allowed to roam a little bit. They were always the first one in the corner after the puck. It was on the left hand side, left winger would go in to support him, right wingers stay high. Goalies never went down. And coaches, X's and O's and systems, forget that. The Russians came in and changed everything. We won that series on heart and grit. Not because we were smart. We got fat, lazy, and complacent. And the Russians woke us up. Between 72 and the early 90s, we changed our game. We dominated. We did it again in 99. We weren't happy with the results, so we changed the game to a focus on technical skills. We are known for this. We do phenomenally dramatic things when we're not happy. I'm suggesting we look at the two pieces missing in, in this model and move it to the 21st century and become the first country 
that looks at changing the game in, well, I would argue, the most significant way possible. And the first thing is character. That's one of the problems with the model. It's not that these A and group B athletes aren't performing. The question is, is what kind of character is behind the performance? Do you, do you present yourself with class and dignity, or are you a liar, cheater, and thief? Because it can go either way. You can be positive or negative on your character. You can still perform. And then the second piece that's critical in this new model has to be the sense of well-being. How does it make you feel when it's done? When you've had the success, what's it do to you? Because it also can be positive or negative. Now, I've not interviewed anybody from either list A or B. I've read a considerable amount, as much as I could find, on some of those athletes. And i got to tell you, the results are consistent. The group B people are miserable. They're either in rehab, addicted to something, in jail, stressed to the limit because they don't know what their future holds. Lance Armstrong just moved out of his million dollar mansion two weeks ago. Not sure where he's going. John McEnroe, fascinating autobiography on John McEnroe. He talks extensively about what it was like growing up as a tennis prodigy. He hated the game. Hated it. Every minute of it. His father pushed him into it, and he despised it. And to make matters worse, it became his identity. John McEnroe, the number one tennis player in the world, he was living, eating, sleeping, breathing it, and he couldn't function. He says, he says he couldn't function a day without worrying, panicking, anxiety attacks over losing that ranking. In fact, he tells a story about <coughs> having to meet his brother in one of the finals, one of the tennis finals. His brother, Patrick, wasn't as good a tennis player as he was, but apparently one particular final, Patrick made it, it was to play John. John couldn't handle the pressure of losing to his brother. He says, I couldn't take it. I couldn't run the risk that my brother would beat me. If my brother would have beaten me, it would have proved to the world that I wasn't the best McEnroe. And so he faked an illness. John McEnroe has come out uh, in the last 10 years to talk about the impact that inappropriate success from poor character can have. These are miserable. Their success comes at a very, very, very high price. Sometimes it takes years. Sometimes they never get there. But some of these group B people are in senior citizens' homes, still talking about the good old days, and it just hasn't moved in yet. Others use their experience to reverse the process. But one thing is for sure. The only way performance, achievement, and success works is if the character is good and the outcome. lots of details about this. Don't take my word for it. Read up on some of these individuals, and you will see there is consistency. Consistency throughout the group A people as to how they achieved what they achieved. There's no mystery to it. The words I'm going to use here in a minute are very familiar to you. My question is, how much of your planning is going into I mean, I, heard, I overheard lots of conversations here in the last two and a half hours. I know some of you are wondering about your system. You're kicking those around. Who am I going to have on my power play, my PK? Some of you are looking to still pick up some players. Wheels are rolling. Who could I get? Who could I get? Most of what I've heard centered around some combination of technical development. What do I need to do in my practices? get the most out of my kids, so win, got to win. Nothing wrong with winning. Let me make that perfectly clear right here. I am not, I'm not one of those who says we should take the concept of winning out of the game. That's the last thing we can do. Western civilization was built on the concept of competing, will to win. You take away the will to win, and you strip kids of any chance they have to cope in this world. 
I'm also not a win at all cost guy. My question to you is, has most of what's been on your mind been how do I compete to win more? Because if I perform, if I enhance performance, I enhance achievement, I enhance success. I do it enough, who knows? I might be the next coach of the Montreal team. Gotta start somewhere, right? <laughs> How much time have you spent building a character building component in your program? I don't care if it's only two months. Two months to a kid in your presence, because let's face it folks, coaches today are arguably the only people left, teachers are gone, only people left that kids, we can be sure, coaching our national game to boot, respect. Can't be guaranteed they've got it in school anymore. Poor teachers today, I don't know how they do it. The hockey coaches, I'm telling you, kids stand up and listen. But you still got that power. So I don't care if it's two months or eight months, you have a tremendous amount of power that you can use to build character in these kids. And that's what I want to talk about. If we're going to do it, how do we do it? Let's look at a model based on what we know the group A people are telling us work for them. It's how they add their success. You've heard some of these concepts already tonight. I'm going to see them again. So. One of the things that I've done, built a model, an approach that you can take and actually build your character program with. It's called Character in Action, Foundation of Performance, Achievement, and Success. And it has four pillars or strategies. Four pillars or strategies. Character, action, relationships, and education. Yeah, we got some up front. Let me tell you a little bit about what this looks like. Relationships. Relationships. You know this already. The key, the key, probably at the heart of what makes Group A people successful and what makes you successful is the ability to establish emotional resonance with your player, your client. I'm only talking about sports here tonight. This cuts across every profession and domain. Every single one. This is the old adage, nobody cares what you know till they know how much you care. Establishing emotional resonance with your players. And taking that connection and applying it to something greater than yourself. This is not the all about me. This pillar functions on the law of Copernicus, which is, the sun doesn't revolve around you. It revolves around something much greater. I had a chance tonight to drive down, you know, and listen to Charlie and Len. You listen very closely. Here's what you hear. I remember so and so. I remember when this happened and that. I didn't hear anything about victories, losses. Len mentioned Claude Gosselin, Goose. You should see the relationship between Len and Goose. Goose played for him 15 years ago. He hasn't missed the summer yet. He's down here every summer, around the Gulf. They work a couple of hockey schools. Goose brings his family down. Len could tell you stories about him and Goose. Goose coming into the, his office one day to tell him that he had to change something, and Len wasn't happy about it. And Len let him know, and Goose let him know that it had to be that way, and Len let him know it couldn't. Before you knew it, they were. There's a very special bond relationship. You have it too with some of the players and parents and different people that you work with. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. The people on the A list have used their talent and ability to do something 
more significant, they changed the game. They're not the ones that ignored signing autographs for little kids because it would impact on the signing value of their autograph when they retired. They knew the impact it was going to have on that kid if he had his or her autograph, so they signed. Something bigger than them. That's the relationship block. The education block, the education pillar. That's the ability, that's the ability to forge knowledge into new truths and insights. As complicated as that might sound, it's pretty simple. I'm going to give you a real good example that just happened. Last weekend, the golf tournament, Tiger's missing. So they're asking some of the experts, they asked Arnold Farmer, they asked Jack, what's the chances that Tiger's going to catch Jack Nicholson on the event number of majors that he's <coughs> starting to fall apart. The wear and tear of what that man has been able to accomplish athletically is starting to wear on. Not to mention perhaps the extracurricular activities. <laughs> you, know what the, you know what the old horses said? You know what the old guard said? It's not his health that's the problem. That's the least of his worries. We got doctors and medication that can fix that. I'll tell you what the problem is, Arnold. Young kids that don't have the same respect for Tiger that the old guard used to have, they don't care. They don't care that Tiger can hit the ball 300 yards. They can hit it 325. And they don't care if he wears red on Sunday to intimidate people. They don't care because they learned from Tiger. They took the knowledge that Tiger gave them and they ran with it. It's history, that's progress. That's what the young bucks do. They take existing knowledge and they make it something better. And the education pillar is all about that. The ability, the ability to not get locked in to a present day thinking and stay there. Go to any Tim Hortons, any morning, you will inevitably find in each Tim Hortons a table with eight to ten little old men. <laughs> half of them are arguing against the unions. The other half are arguing for the unions. Sometimes I just want to tell them, boys, it's been 40 years. Times have changed. Things are a little bit different. Might be time. Read a book, a newspaper, something. Snap out of this thing. The ability to think beyond what we think we know. Knowledge is imperfect. Whatever you know today is going to change tomorrow. That's one of the realities of our existing world. Global economy, internet, you can't stand still anymore. You've got to move, you've got to learn, you've got to change. The action pillar. It's not enough to know something new. You've got to be able to act on it. I know fruits and vegetables are good for me. I can usually go a couple of days and then I'm back with the I know I should go to the gym. And I do enjoy it for about a week. And I stop acting on what I know to be true. The action pillar is an ability to be able to stay on task. And finally, the character pillar, well, that's the creme de la creme. That's the cherry at the top. When you start working on the different abilities, the skill sets that we're going to look at in here in a minute, something starts to transform. You change. You become different. I have friends who are not hockey fans. They hate hockey. But they've met John Bellamy. And they've told me they've never met anybody with such presence. We're talking from the car coming down about Bobby Orr and the reputation he has. When he goes across countries, charity golf tour, Establishing relationships and providing a service to others over and above him for bigger causes, the relationship. And the presence that this man brings, his humility. Those are the those are the big The character and what that amounts to in the way of success. What are we doing in our hockey programs this week to build those four abilities? 
We all know that your kids are going to need to skate, shoot, pass, puck control, checking. You've got five fundamental skill sets that you're going to work on in the game. Shooting, passing, skating, puck control, checking. What about character, action, relationships, and education? I know you know it. You know you know it. And you're already doing some of it. Are you putting in half as much time into planning that as you are the technical side? Is it just because we don't have enough resources? We're providing you right now a resource easy to refer to. All you gotta do is build this stuff in. Here are the 16 skill sets that fall under each of the pillars. Each pillar has skills built into it. If you're gonna teach a child to skate well, extremely well, you're going to talk about knee bend. You're going to talk about leg extension. You're going to talk about toe snap. You're going to talk about the alignment, posture, alignment of the hip and the knee and the toe. Well, there are aspects to these abilities that you also have to work on. The education pillar, the relationships, but each pillar has its skill sets. I'm going to spend a, just a few minutes on a couple of these just so that you get an idea. The handouts that you've got give you a brief description of each one, which would allow you to interpret it, build it in. We'll talk about that in a minute. Education, I want to talk about a couple of things that adversity, make reference to it earlier, adversity. We're living in a society where we're over protecting our kids. Research is clear. The kids are risking it up and we're over protecting them. And I'm, and I'm guilty of it. I got a 20 year old daughter. And when she calls me from university in tears, some guy didn't show up for a day. Or come, I don't even hang up the phone. I've got an emergency bag at home, okay? I've got, I've got, I've got rifles, handguns, handguns. <laughs> I got a service center missile launcher, and I'm in the car and I'm off the Fredericton before she even knows I'm not on the phone. Anything goes wrong with my son or daughter, first thing, my instinct is to protect them. Eliminate the problem or eliminate the person. It don't matter. I <laughs> need to make sure they don't suffer. They cannot suffer. It doesn't make any sense. The group A people will tell you they got to where they are from adversity. If I was to ask you, the greatest lesson you've learned in life, or the top three if you can't figure out one, you learned how the hard way. The easy ones, we forget those. We learn the hard way. When you're working with your players, easy, easy to learn lessons from the losses. A little more difficult to learn from the wins. We don't bother learning from the wins because, hey, we won. We're a king of the mountain. We dominate. You learn things the hard way. But we're a generation that's removing removing as much as possible, because we don't want our kids to suffer. That's understandable. But at what cost? And I'm not suggesting we, you know, we toss them off the bridges on bungee ropes, and that's all I'm saying. But maybe be a little more sensitive to the lessons learned through adversity. Excellence. Excellence. Group A athletes know that the game is changing, they have to change, and they redefine, they raise the bar. They raise the bar, constantly. Constantly raising the bar. Remember when Tiger was number one? He was, like, it was like 80 million in sponsorships. He didn't even have to golf. And at the end of one of the seasons, number one golf in the world, all kinds of money, what's he do? He changes his game goes up and gets himself a new coach, and he completely revamps his game. Why? Because he knew that there were young players coming up that could do what he could do, and he needed to find the next level. He's searching for excellence. The great competitors are always looking for excellence. Are we teaching that to our children? And if so, how are you doing it? How much time are you spending on it? I just was talking to Charlie on the drive down. I read in our, I got an email this week Invitation to a conference on perfectionism. Apparently, it's now a disease. There's a psychologist who's 
doing work with some of the professionals that I work with around how to help people who are perfectionists. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a place where perfectionism can go where it's probably not conducive to healthy living. I understand that. My fear is, if we start talking about perfectionism as being this big problem, where are we going to start to find the answers? Because I don't know about you, but the teams that I've been involved in, we've always focused on being the best of the best, better than we can be, aiming for the stars, chase perfection, settle for excellence. What's going to happen if we start telling our kids, perfectionism is a myth. Settle for mediocrity. It's okay to be average, not to a great competitor. Nobody on the A-list is mediocre. And they don't settle for anything less than excellence. Relationships. Cooperate. I'm going to touch on cooperation and emotions. Cooperation. We have a saying in hockey, it's in sports, it's across business. Players play, coaches coach, and managers manage. Want to know when things start to fall apart? It's when players want to coach, coaches want to manage, managers want to play. You have a role to play. Whatever relationship you have, you have several. You're a hockey coach, you're a mom or a dad, you're a husband or a wife, you have friends, you're a sister, you're an aunt, you're a brother. These are relationships in your life. They're key relationships. You have a role to play. Each of those has a role. There are expectations, and you're expected to play those. When my best friend calls me up and he's in trouble, I'm there. It's part of my role. You've got to play your role. We get in trouble when we try to play somebody else's role. I'm an assistant coach with the University of Moncton Blue Eagle. I'm an assistant coach. That gives me the right to some things and not to others. And it's up to me to fulfill that role and not want to play Serge's role. <laughs> It's easy to do, right? Easy for me. I don't get my name in the paper on Monday. Geez, sir, you should have done that. Geez, Charlie, you should have done it this way. Play your role. If you're not satisfied with your role, that's okay. You can change roles. You can go to school, work harder, study a little more. Do it. You can change roles. But not on game day. Game day, you're expected to be a third line center, not a first line center. You're not playing power play, you're not playing, playing PK. So don't talk to me about that today. Play your role. Great competitors play their role. And here's the kicker. They don't do it because they're willing to do it. They do it because they're eager to do it. Great story. Joel Thornton, when he got invited to his last Olympics, he was getting up there. There were a lot of younger guys scoring as many goals as he was. But they liked his character, they liked his presence in the dressing room, they liked his leadership. So they went to him and said, Joe, love to have you on the team. Love to have you at the Olympics. But we don't have the first or second line open. Wondering if you'd be willing to play a third, fourth line role. You know what Joe said? He could have said, go pound sand. I've done, I've paid my dues in this league. I deserve a little more respect. No, I'm not going. He could have said, yeah, sure, I'll go. I'm willing to try. He said, holy cow, I love the chance to play that role. Never played it before. Jeez, I'm, I'm eager to do that. Love to try to do that. See if I can make a He was eager to play a role that wasn't customary to him. That's the difference between a great competitor. They're not willing to make sacrifices. They're eager to do it. Emotions? Great competitors are passionate. Very passionate. They play with a lot of heart, a lot of feel, sometimes anger, sometimes elation, but they never let it distract them. They know that if they slip up, an error on emotions can cost them a game, cost them a play. So they, they, they learn to control their emotions. And I'm not just talking about the angry emotions. I'm talking about the good ones. Great competitors are not the ones, after winning a hockey game, that skate by the opposing team's bench and... Positive and negative emotions, controlling those. 
the action pillar wanted to touch on allegiance and endurance. Allegiance. Loyalty. Had a big argument with a presenter last year. I went to a conference. It was given by one of the most prestigious con consultation firms in Eastern Canada. And the presenter stood up and said, there is no such thing as loyalty anymore. It's a myth. In today's world, there are employers and employees. There are leaders and followers, bosses and workers. The employer offers a contract, the employee accepts it. In terms of the contract are all we worry about. If I'm not happy with your service, I'll find myself somebody else. And if you're not happy with what I'm offering you, you'll find employment somewhere. So a guy gets drafted by a team who invests money into him, his development, plays for them for seven, eight years. He's coming off of a four-year, $12 million contract, three million bucks a year, he signs someplace else for 3.1. There's no loyalty anymore. Look, I've had the privilege of being involved with some great hockey teams, some great sports teams, some great organizations, some great professional opportunities. I've been involved with some great elite players, and I've got to tell you, not a single one that was successful didn't have a, a bond so strong as to be able to get past the inevitable problems you're going to have as a team. There's a powerful bond required to win. And you've got to be more than just willing to support your team again. You've got, to be, you've got to be ready to sacrifice. That takes loyalty. For that bond to happen takes loyalty. I don't think it can, I don't think it can happen without it. I'm not sure we're doing enough to teach loyalty anymore. And endurance. <coughs> we live in a fast food world. Immediate gratification. What have you done for me lately? What can you do for me now? Now. I need it, I want it now. Look, nobody on the Group A list made it overnight. The amount of work and energy it takes to succeed the right way, I'm not talking about lying, cheating, or stealing. Drugs will get you there a little quicker. I'm talking about the right way, not the easy way. There's a difference. Takes endurance, the concept of patience, perseverance, helping our youth understand that they can achieve and they can succeed, but it's going to take time. It's a process. It's not an outcome. It's a process. Building that concept into your programming is important. Last but not least, character. The only one I want to touch on there is the attitude. You read the list. What jumps out the most about those athletes is their humility. I'm not talking about a personality of being taken advantage of either. I'm talking about humble, positive, focused on others, not on self. That presence that Bobby Orr and, and John Belliveau, Mariano Rivera, I don't even like the Yankees. I'm a Red Sox fan. I was born to hate the Yankees. I get up an hour earlier every morning just to hate them more. <laughs> but I gotta tell you, I haven't seen a guy with as much class as Mariano Rivera in a long, long time. I mean, his his year, that departure year for him was just I mean, he, what a what a great human being. Great competitors present an attitude of humility positive energy, enthusiasm, focus on others, not on self. They're not selfish people. You can tell. All right. Real quick. I said that success has to be dependent on something positive. I'm suggesting you move away from the concept of being fame power. Not because they're not important. Don't get me wrong. We live in a capitalist society. I'm not a Marxist. But those things should come 
as a result of being a group A guy. And at the end of the day, if this isn't what you're feeling, there's something wrong. Because the, the one thing that distinguishes the group A from the group B folks are those four words. When it comes to character, a sense of serenity to who they are. When it comes to action, a sense of contentment. I've accomplished something. I did it. It was hard, but I did it. You know what this feels like. You've had these feelings. You know what I'm talking about. Joy, not happiness. Joy. Happiness is an emotion, just like anger. It comes and it goes. It's fleeting. We're spending too much time telling our kids they have to be happy. So when it doesn't happen, they have to invent ways to be it. And sometimes the ways they invent are not that good. Joy, on the other hand, is the ability to take the good and the bad in life, put them together, and come up with some sort of understanding of your I think that's more powerful than being happy. And last but not least, the concept of peace of mind. When you when you reflected enough on some on some issue, and you've come to some understanding, however temporary it might be. You go to bed at night thinking, you know what? I can feel good about myself. I I thought that through today. I'm not sure I did the right thing exactly, but I thought it through and I did something. And tomorrow's another day, and I'll go back at it. Peace of mind. If we don't feel those, there's something wrong with one of the pillars. And you know that money, fame, and power don't necessarily bring those four things. They can, but they tend not to, they tend not to, when that's our focus. If that's our focus, different story. Sometimes the money, fame, and power trickle down from that. Wonderful. But I think you need that first. So, I'm suggesting a game plan for you. Number one, don't take my word for this stuff. Research it yourself. Read some autobiographies, watch some of these movies, research some of these people, and I think you're going to find the same consistency that I found. Plan your program. You probably have an eight-week program, and you've got your power play built in, you know when you're going to work on that, you know what system you're going to run, you know your PK, you probably know your offensive, defensive zone coverage, you probably gave that some thought. You certainly thought, now play with me here a little bit, depends on your age group, I understand. You've probably done some work on your technical skills development, you know, how, you know you're going to work on skating, shooting, passing, how you're going to do that. Build your character development component in there. Build your character development program into your eight-week program. Know what you're going to work on before your season starts. Then talk about it. Talk about it. Lots of opportunity here. You can take advantage of situations and circumstances that are already going to come up. You've got a pre-game, a post-game, you've got practices. Ideal opportunity to bring up any one of the concepts. Or others, if you feel I've missed something, bring up some of these concepts within the context of your pre-game, post-game, and practices. Boys, we're playing the, uh, the top team in the division. They haven't been beat, beaten in five years. Let's talk a little bit about will to win. Emotions. Talk a little bit about that in the pregame. Between periods. After the game. Whether you've won or lost, how can you incorporate some of those character building items into your postgame? Injuries. Boys, first line center's down, broken leg. <coughs> Somebody's going to have to step up. <clears throat> Responsibility. One of the character traits on the chart. Somebody's going to have to step up. Let's talk about what that's going to look like. you got tournaments, we're going to be away, hotels, restaurants. How are we going to conduct ourselves? Well, I know you've already talked about that a lot now. But is it built in as a specific component that you're going to focus on, that you looked at, thought about? Playoffs, opponents. Create situations and circumstances. Special teams. Who's playing your power play? Who's playing your PK? Have you thought about rotating that? If you're going to rotate it, I'm not a fan of rotating positions and letters if you're just doing it to do it. I am a fan of doing it with the express purpose of discussing with the player, as Charlie mentioned, talk to them about what the responsibility is. Perfect. Brilliant. Every kid in your program should wear the C and the A. Every one. But you shouldn't be taking responsibility and explaining to them what that means. I don't care if it is what they mean. You have no idea what impact that might have on that kid. You don't. 
That's one of the most difficult things about care. You don't have control over the impact it's going to have. But you do it anyway. You do the right thing anyway because it just might change a kid's life. Reinforce the character as it happens. One of the most powerful things you can do is take a player aside and say, hey, I noticed that. Let me tell you how I feel. Let me tell you about that. Uh, we got a kid this year, third year, first two years, big disappointment. Came into training camp overweight, no passion, no dedication. Of course, he ended up on the fourth line two years ago. Last year was a healthy scratch. Bad attitude. He came into camp this year, five pounds underweight. Lots of enthusiasm. No complaint. Stuck him on the fourth line again, never said a word. Went out, busted his hind. By Christmas, I'm telling Serge, we gotta pull this kid in. Tell him. So he did. So he brought him in and he said, Look, I don't know what it is that you did, because we were on the verge of letting you go. But kudos to you, kid. Amazing the job you've done here. Your attitude, your enthusiasm. You didn't ask for a thing. You didn't even get anything for it. We basically run you on the fourth line for two months. Boys, you're still in the gym every day, keeping the weight down. You're a real enthusiastic presence in the dressing room. Thank you. you know, this is why I like to coach, being around people like you. Well, the kid, it was like giving him a million dollars. Use those opportunities to reinforce the character when you see it. And last but not least, here's the tough one. You're going to have to model this stuff. And modeling it means you're going to have to exercise. You, you, you can't kid a kid. You can't fool them. They know the difference between good character and bad. So you're not going to be able to show up at games and practices and pretend that you're, you know, or Bobby or. You're going to have to live it. So if there are some character flaws around any of those for you, you're going to have to fix them. That's what great competitors do. Great competitors work on this constantly. This is what makes them great. They're not born that way. Don't kid yourself. Research is clear. Greatness is not innate. It's not genetic. Yes, there are some factors related to good and bad that are genetic. But the outcome of greatness is not born. Nelson Mandela wasn't born great. Mother Teresa wasn't born great. <coughs> Wayne Gretzky, Mary Lemieux. I don't care what domain we're talking about. Greatness is not genetic in any It comes with effort around character blocks and skill traits that need to be practiced and learned. You have the ideal opportunity to do it, but you're going to have to invest into it. And don't, you know what? I've, I've been where you are. I'm still there. Let's face it. Let's be honest. Lots of times you walk into the ring. It's a great feeling to know that you're the head coach. The parents are watching you, the kids are watching you, and that feeling of power, success. Be careful with that. Your very short hop, skip, and a jump from ending up in not a good place. You're there for the kids. It's not about you. It's never been about you. It'll never be about you. It's not the way we build the system. It's about the kids. So the next time the clock is winding down and you want to shorten your bench, I'll have a problem with that. It's part of life. But give some thought as to how you do it. And whether or not giving that third line kid an opportunity in the last 35 seconds, is that an opportunity to send messages to that kid and the rest of the team about what character is all about? Or is it really just all about getting that win? And if you reflect on all the wins that you've managed, any of them really that important? Do you remember any of them that, that well? Or do you remember the relationships? Glenn's not wearing his ring tonight. <coughs> He's a CIS Coach of the Year. He's got a national championship. And he talked about Goose. Because that's what he remembers. And I asked him, by the way, during the break, what do you miss the most? I miss the guys. I miss the kids. I miss being around them. I miss competing with them. It's not the money, it's not the victories. Len's making more money doing these seminars for Charlie now. 
<laughs> Relationships. So, my message tonight in a nutshell. Develop great hockey stars. Yes, you can protect the skills development. But, listen, even at the pro level, there's an emphasis and a focus on character. Okay? Major League Baseball has a program now where all the teams can send their number one draft picks, their stars of the future, while they're still in the minors, to this program where they talk about this stuff. About the fact that they're going to be rich, famous, and when they leave the ballpark, it's probably going to be a lineup of girls. And somebody else trying to sell them. And this program is designed to help them cope with it now. Most of the NFL teams, basketball teams, they all have team psychologists, team chaplains. Everybody's trying to find the key. You hear it at draft time every year. Geez, the, the global economy now is so big, the sea is so big, we can find stars everywhere. What we're looking for is character. I can find a number, I can find a first line center between here and Yugoslavia like that. What I don't know if I can find is a guy that's going to be an addition character addition to my organization. So develop the great hockey players, but no, no, if you have a choice between a great A hockey player or a B hockey player, which one's better for you and the organization? Remember that. Not all the kids you're going to have are going to be Sidney Crosby. You're not going to have the McKinnons all the time. In fact, the percentage is pretty low. What you've managed to do in the year is, is really quite remarkable. Statistics are pretty low. It's like 99.999% of your kids are not going to play professional hockey, make a living at it. Certainly, they're not going to be Sidney Crosby's. But you know what they can be? As a result of your influence and how much character that you built, they can, they can be great doctors, lawyers. God knows we need a great politician. We need great leaders. And you know what? end of the day, we need great moms and dads. And the same character traits we're talking about here apply to moms and dads. Your kids can be better moms and dads because of what they experience in your program. How much more not you can something become? How much more contribution can you make? Develop great hockey players. Character is going to be important. If you don't develop a hockey player, you'll at least have a great person. And you know what? At the end of the day, you do this stuff, you build this into your program, and you do it well, you're going to enhance both yours and your players' price satisfaction. I'm pretty sure the group A guys and girls are feeling a little more life satisfaction than the group Bs. In fact, I know it because, as I said, I've researched it. I know that. It doesn't mean that the group B people are uh, hopeless. Many of them do regroup. Back. But when they do, it's using the same formula as the group A people. So why not teach it now? Why not spend the time now? Build it into your program. Spend as much time on it as everything else. Don't abandon it. It's time we stop talking about character like it's important and actually act on it. We're not spending enough time. And we need to. Chief, our society is desperate more great people. Where's the next Nelson Mandela? Where's the next Abraham Lincoln? You got it. And you can do it using the greatest game on earth. I hope you guys have a successful hockey season. I hope you develop great hockey players. You do. Most importantly of all, I hope you develop great people. I hope you take the time to think about it. Do what you need to do. Develop some